Otherwise, the screen, the, the verses will be on the screen this evening. And uh, we are going back to First Thessalonians, where we were in our reading earlier this morning. Uh, earlier this morning, earlier tonight, and uh, it's morning somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, but nonetheless, we're going to get into this message this evening, and we'll open up with a few things. And uh, some of tonight is going to be a bit of a uh, reminder. So we're going to test some, some here this evening. We're going to test your memory. We're going to test your memory, not out loud, not calling, you know, not asking for hands to be raised or anything like that. But I want to bring a few thoughts to you, a few definitions to you. We're getting into our verses tonight give you the title and then we'll move forward tonight but I want to talk to you first off just by by use the word legacy when we talk about the word legacy uh, legacy is defined in its simplest terms anything handed down uh, from the past you know so there is a legacy somewhere something that you've taken uh, from the past and you've handed it down and it's continually to be uh, given to the current generation and those that are lie before them but a legend is defined as a collection of stories about an admirable person so as we get into our verses tonight, I want you to think about uh, what the Apostle Paul was saying as he wrote. This is his first letter, mind you. And there's a bit of um, argument as to whether or not Hebrews would have been his first letter, letter. But we do know this is his first letter written to a Gentile church, to say the least. And uh, Paul dealt with uh, many adversaries in Thessalonica. When he went there and he preached the gospel, uh, uh, he had, matter of fact, he had Judaizers that actually followed him from this area throughout his trip and uh, resulted in him being stoned to death one time. There, there's a lot of damage that was caused, but there was a great and wonderful uh, mark that was received uh, here in this church, uh, even in great adver adversity and great challenge and great problems and struggles and battles and things that none of us here deal with. None of us deal with any of these things. We don't have people showing up and, uh, uh, you know, trying to throw rocks at us here because of our standing and our belief in the Word of God. Uh, but Paul dealt with that there. These people of this church dealt with it. And so if you look there again with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, to begin with, Paul says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. That's odd, isn't it? To put much affliction and joy in the same sentence, isn't it? Uh, it goes on to say here, verse 7, So that ye were examples to all that believed, uh, that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. So, you know, coming off the backside of defining what a legend is, I would ask you, what goes into making a legend? We've, we've all grown up and heard, heard stories of, uh, of legacies and the legacy of the mighty men of, of valor and, the, um, you know, that legends are more myth than they are reality. And, and one thought has always been applied to the notions of legends, and that is in order to have a les legend or be a legend or to leave a legacy, one must do so at the point of death. You know, you always hear that uh, men's last words, their final words, or people's last words are the things that, that people always tend to remember. And I, I understand that is true, and it marks people. But I've also heard some crazy, crazy things in the moment of people's death in their last few moments. And I sure would not adhere that, to say that would be their living legacy or their legend that they would pass down. But we grew up with this idea that the only way to have a legend is that when the life in this world comes to an end, and I want to speak to you this evening on this topic of, of legends tonight. I want to talk to you about what goes into being or becoming a legend. And I'm going to submit this thought to you this evening. We are challenged to do quite the opposite of what I just said. Because we just read here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, that Paul says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad. He's writing to people who are alive and living. He's writing to a church that is thriving, that is worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, that is in the midst of revivals and in the midst of great affliction, yet having great joy in the power and might of the Holy Spirit of God. And he, Paul says, we don't need to even speak a thing because everybody hears and knows of who and what you are. Yet we think in order for a legend to be true or a legend to go forward, that that person or people or entity has to die off the scene. 
And there is no rule, there is no order of commandments stating that one's life must venture off in the sunset to establish a legacy. A legacy is not just something that we leave behind, but rather a legacy is something that we live right now. And that's what I want to encourage you to do. We should live, guys, in such a way that, that we will be a blessings to others now and for generations to come. But the challenge for us is to strive so that we impact those in our sphere of influence. Not when we die, but every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. And this is how a legend is born. A legend will leave a legacy in their path affecting those he or she comes into contact with every single day. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans 14. He says there, he says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Everybody has an influence in their life. Everyone in this room tonight has an effect on someone around them. It is, it is impossible for you not to. You say, well, preacher, I'm just going to be a hermit. I'm going to hole up in my room, and I'm never going to come out. You're going to be affecting someone negatively by not being in their presence, do you understand? There is no way you're going to live this life today and not have an effect, positive or negative, on those that are around you. It does not work. It will not happen. Think back to those who have, who have had a, a bearing in your life. I'm not saying it necessarily has to be positive. But think back to those who positively or negatively uh, who have impacted your life. Everyone in one, sh one way, shape, form, or fashion has had an impact in your growth and your development or your hindrance. Think about a coach or something. If you were, uh, if you were a sports person, an athlete, think about a coach who challenged you, one who pushed you, one who pressed you to be the best that you can be at that given moment to perform at a level, battle, a level better than status quo. I, I realize... Uh, I realize I'm older, you know. My, my brain, I'm still in the mid-20s. I was reminded just before church tonight how old I really am. And it was so great that I wasn't the one doing that. Amen. Just kidding. <laughs> Saying that, guys, I, I, I look at our generation today, and I, and I see a, a generation that is seemingly, guys, I'm just saying seemingly. I'm stepping outside, looking into the glass from the outside area. It seems like they're just satisfied with the bare minimum. Let's just do as least as we can. Think about that employer, guys, who challenged you to reach beyond mediocrity. That, that employer who challenged you to strive for that promotion, to work hard, to dig your heels and do the best that you can to get them in the next promotion in the ladder. Think about the parent who influenced you, who led and guided you to make decisions in your life that directly affected you and in turn affected others for decades to come. My dad raised me with the idea of tomorrow never comes. I grew up hearing that constantly, still hear it today. At the end, you guys have heard this story, I'm going to repeat it anyway, but you know, at the end, because I'm old, I do think old people do things like that, I'm just kidding. At the end of every single season, and I mean, when I mean the end, I mean, if it was high school, it was Friday night, it was either that night or Saturday morning at the table when I was eating my cereal trying to watch cartoons. And yes, I watched cartoons up until adulthood, and if they were on, good ones were on now, I'd still watch them. But anyway, I, you know, he would sit me down, and he would tell me that your, your the training for off season starts now. Mentally, physically, emotionally, it starts now. And he would tell me that your opponent is training right now. And if you skip today, he's going to have the advantage on you next year when you meet one another. And he would take a calendar. And he would mark how many days were there. If the last game was last night. Uh, in college, it would have been a Saturday game. But, he, you know, here's the, here's the last game here. Here's the first game here. Here's preseason games right here. This is how many days you have from this point to that point to be ready for the next season. And for every day you miss, every training session you skip, every time that you don't do what your opponent is doing, you're never going to get it back. And if you, if you skip something your opponent doesn't, your opponent's going to win on game day. But the problem is we live in a society today where people depend on their opponent's weakness rather than being the best. They depend on the other person to, be to not challenge them. They depend on that team to be weaker, not them to be stronger. 
Guys, I don't want to win a position, be it at work or, uh, you know, not work anymore, but, but but in the office or whatever it may be. I don't want to win a challenge. I don't want to have an effect on someone because of the opponent's weakness, but rather because I've done the best that I can do in my life. I mean, who wants a business that, well, it isn't as slow as the one down the road? Hey, we're not the best, but we're not bad as that one. I mean, you know, who, who wants a, a team who just isn't weak as the la- They're not as weak as the last ranked team in the in the league, but, you know, hey. You know, I don't want to have a church, guys. It's not as bad as the one down the street. But rather, I want one that is aligned with the purity of the Holy Scriptures and places the Lord first and foremost have an effect on those that are around them. That's what I want every single day. That's what I want in my life every single day, every single minute, every single moment, is to have some type of effect on those that are around me. Not because I want to leave a lasting legacy or a lasting my name float. I could care less if anybody ever hears or knows my name a day, to be honest with you. But if I can do something to affect you, and then in turn you can do something to affect someone else, and on and on and on down it goes, that's where legends are made. Beloved, we can depend on others to fall. We can become complacent in life. Hoping that will have an effect on others, but it will not. I've quoted him many times, but Coach Nick Saban, when he was asked what the greatest threat to excellence was, without hesitation, he said complacency. He went on to say that being satisfied with where you are, complacency creates a blatant disregard for doing what is right. He said, complacency, he says, you can't do the things you feel like doing. You have to choose to do the things that, um, that are going to help you accomplish the goals you have. Because let's be honest, some days you just don't feel like it. Some days you're tired. Some days you don't want to give 100%. And some days your 100% is other days 80%. Saban goes on to say that when you are complacent, you lose the respect for winning. Bear Bryant was asked one time, I know you guys don't know who Bear Bryant is, Bear Bryant was the greatest coach who ever lived. Uh, Nick Saban is up there now. They coach both at Alabama. And, uh, but anyway, Bear Bryant said, if winning is not important, because in his latter years, and uh, his latter years, this whole idea from Dr. Spock and whatnot, was thought, well, you know, we don't need to keep score. Everybody gets a blue ribbon. You know, just make people feel comfortable, make them feel good. And winning's not important about how you play the game. And Bear just sat there and listened to all their quotes and topics and statistics. And he said, well, if winning's not important, why do they keep score? And that was all he said. Now, guys, you're not, you're not in competition with the church down the road. You may, be, you may be in competition with somebody at work. And rightly so, I think you should be, to be honest with you. I mean, I think we should strive every single day to be better than the person next to us. To be better for the company, to be better for the team, better in our society, better in our world. I think I think competition drives us to get away from complacency and to win. And what does it do? It has an effect on those that are around us. So what is it a legacy, guys? What does it take to make a legend today? Number one, we find that it requires leadership. It requires leadership. And back in verse 6 there, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul says, you became followers of us and of the Lord. They became followers of the Lord Jesus Christ because they followed the leadership of who followed Jesus Christ. That was the Apostle Paul and Silas in those. They, they became followers of them because simply they saw how they obeyed and, and followed Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul stepped up into Thessalonica, guys, and, and he flat out preached the plain, pure gospel, the good news of our, our Lord and Savior. Uh, but it wasn't just preaching, guys, whereas preaching is important and, and should be the central theme of any church and any service. But the preaching was followed by power, guys. Notice there in verse 5, notice what he says here. He says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. There is such a movement today, there is such a movement today to make Christianity weak, slurpy, almost sickly and anemic, if you will. And this was not the movement of the first century church. The gospel was preached with power, and it should be preached with power. If you're confident about something, and there's power in the Word of God, and I don't believe there's any greater power on the face of this planet than what we have right here in this book. This is the the only book that can give us life in in this world. 
It ought to be preached with power. It shouldn't be preached with slurpy, weak, sickly looking anemic words. Preach it with power, man. We also find that it was followed by a person. He says, and in the Holy Ghost. You say, wait a second. Yeah, the Holy Ghost is a person, guys. He's an entity. He's the third person of the Trinity. When one looked back at the, at the very first deacons over in Acts, you'll find the first requirements where these men were to be men of faith and the Holy Ghost. And speaking of Stephen, that faithful martyr, it was said of him that he was full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Later on, it said he was full of faith and power. So what does that tell us tonight? It tells us that where the Holy Ghost is, there's power. And where power is, it's rooted by the Holy Ghost. If Stephen was full of faith and the power, faith in the Holy Ghost, he had no room for anything else in his life. No room for himself. The first century Christians, guys, did not go in their own power, but rather they went into the power of the person of the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, uh, tells us there, uh, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now, if you try to take a stand on the Bible in your own power, you're going to fail. The Bible's not going to fail. But if you try to take a stand because you're quick-witted and you got quick words and you're intelligent, you got all these degrees behind your names, and, and you just try to take your words and twist them and throw people off, if you're doing that, guys, you're going to fail every single time. But if you stand up today, if you struggle to string ten words together, but you stand in the power and might of the Holy Spirit of God, and you stand upon that word, you're going to have an influence on people in this life today because of the leadership that God used to put this book together. There's a person that's there. You trust in him. There was proof that was around them. Look at verse, C, verse 5 in the latter, latter part. It says, In much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Beloved, these men, Paul, Silas, Timothy, had no hidden agendas. Their life, uh, they lived the life of openness. Their manner of being was, was assuring the fact that they lived what they preached. Proof was seen in their life, their actions, their attitude, and the acknowledging of who and where such power came from. It wasn't for themselves. I mean, Paul was, so, Paul, guys, Paul had everything prior to salvation. He had power, position, prestige, preeminence. He had all these things, and yet he's counted it all but loss. He counted it all but dung, he said. Then he win Christ. Paul had a leadership when he was saved. They had an influence on people of Thessalonica. His effect was seen in their actions of others. His intentional influence was rooted and grounded, point number two, in love. Verse three tells us this in our text tonight. It says, remember without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Guys, if they became followers of the Christianity that Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus exemplified, then we see a reciprocating labor of love in their life. Love, beloved. Love enables us to have an impact on others. That's what it does. You can't fake love. You can't fake love for your fellow friend, fellow neighbor, fellow. You can't fake it. You can be nice and kind. You can have a facade. You can do you can do that for a short period of time, but it's only a labor of love. That I say, have you coming back, coming back, coming back, and coming back? Because you're going to get hurt. You're going to get abused. You're not going to get what you think is going to see in that impact every single time. But it love. I love to love keep you going. Again, I go back to the bringing people into your mind. Remember those coaches who showed up every single day. Every single day. Remember those family members who showed up every single day. Those school teachers who showed up every single day. Remember those neighbors that, that you spoke to earlier every single day. They see a pattern in your life of serving God. A pattern that is having an impact on them even if they don't realize it. There's a mighty impact of effectuality in our lives because of love. Leaders impact with love by being invested. That's the key. That, that's the key, just by being invested. So, Paul wrote to the church of Corinth saying, I, am very gladly spent, uh, I, I will very gladly spend and, and be spent for you. Though more, the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Think about that for just a second. Paul is saying here, real quick, he's saying, 
I'm going to love you with all my heart, my soul, but the more I put my love out into your life, the more I invest in you, the less return I'm getting. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm seeking my heart, I'm seeking my life, I'm seeking all of this stuff into you, yet I'm not, I'm not going to get it back in return. Investing in the lives of others has nothing to do with what we may receive, but everything with how it's going to positively affect their life. And guys, when you're invested, truly invested in leadership, the leadership of love, then we're involved. This was the mindset of the Apostle Paul, the man, the men he trained up, the ladies who labored beside him, all who took the role of his mighty leadership because he was involved in their lives. We see this world today, we see when someone truly loves someone. We'll see the great willingness to put themselves to the side, to be involved in other people's lives, to come invested. It's such a great price and such a great experience. What's to come of the leadership of love? What will come of the soul who chooses for their legacy of intentionally influencing others in the here and in the now, opposed to decades after they're gone? That's, and I believe that tonight. I believe in all of my heart that you know you don't have to die I know you got to die to be on a stamp. I understand that, but we're not being interested to be on a stamp. We want to have an impact, invest our life, be involved in people's life, make a difference in their day. What it is, guys, it's 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 an effective life. It's an effective life. Verse eight says, "For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to Godward is spread abroad." So that we need not to speak anything. Now, in the context of leadership, a legacy leader is one whose leadership has an impact now and has an impact in generations to come. And I want you to think uh, under these terms. Imagine with me that, that if we toss a rock into a lake, if we toss a rock into a lake, guys, uh, initially there's a big, massive splash, right? And the water goes up, and it goes out, and it goes down, correct? That's what it does. And it's, I love seeing those slow motion, those time-lapse videos of when a pebble's dropped and, and how the forces are generated out, then they come back in, or then they go out again. But from that initial splash continues a, a ripple outwardly of that water, a ripple that some physicists have described. That if, there, if it would never come into contact with anything, that that ripple would continue on for eternity, for infinity, they would say. This represents the ongoing impact, the continual intentional influence for generations to come that everyone in this room tonight can and does have on people's life, on their eternal life. What you do and say and how you live your life has an effect in eternity. We can see the, the ripple of Paul's relationship with the Thessalonians. Paul and his leadership team impacted uh, the church there in Thessalonica, uh, who turned from idol worship. Uh, they turned from live and turned to, to living for the true and living God. Then they became followers of Paul and his team and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this directly impacted the, which is the the initial splash, the direct impact, didn't just end there. Not only did the Thessalonians become followers, but they became examples. They became examples to others. In verse 7 of our text here, it says, So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. I mean, guys, a ripple begins, and it doesn't stop there. When we go back to verse 8, we see, For, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad. Can you imagine that, this ripple effect? Can you imagine tonight that, that everywhere that, uh, that someone would go, they'd hear about a church down there and that's meeting in the community center. They hear about you and how you're serving the Lord and how you're faithful and how you attend and how you serve God and, and how you invest in people. Can you imagine that effect going on in northern Wales and northern England and Scotland across the globe? I can tell you right now that people in the United States know about you here. They talk about you here. They've read our letters. They've heard my testimonies. They've invited me in uh, to preach. And, and I've had people send me text messages and, and ask about so-and-so. How's so-and-so doing? 
How's this person doing? How, how are, and, and you guys wouldn't know them from Adam. But it's been an encouragement and an effect on people around the world. And this ripple effect, guys, demonstrates the main idea of what a legacy is. It's leadership. Intentionally influencing others and, and understanding by doing so, you're developing leaders of their own right. Who will follow suit? Again, the initial wave of followers, they, uh, they became examples to others who intentionally influenced the generations to come. And this is an ongoing process. A legacy and a legend is having an impact now. Not when they die, not when it ends, but today. Yes, it's an initial splash. Yes, it's a ripple that goes out. But it should have an impact in generations to come. So I ask you this evening, guys. What goes into making a legend? It's a legacy of intentional influence. That's what goes into making a legend. It's leading with purpose. I don't understand. I, I One of the areas that I struggle greatly, and I, and I mean, I like to know why people do what they do. That That's that's the way my brain works. It's probably the reason that I went into the education that I did. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to have these toys, and, and I enjoyed the toys, but I wanted to know why they did what they did. And one of the biggest whoopings I ever got in my life as a little kid was because I took apart a brand spanking new toy my parents got me for Christmas. Took it all apart. And then when they asked me why, I said, I want to know what it was made out of. That's the way my head works. I wanted to know, I want to know what makes people do what they do, what makes them tick. So I struggle with, I struggle at times when I see individuals who seemingly are not walking with purpose, with purpose. That, that's my shortcoming. That's one of my weaknesses. It, it, I, it doesn't affect me in dealing with them. It doesn't affect me in investing in them, in attempting to impact them, to influence them, uh, it, to be involved in them. It doesn't. But I'll tell you. There's a purpose there in each one of our lives. You're not here by accident. You're not living and breathing and your heart beating tonight without having a purpose that God has designed. You say, what is it? The will of God is to be faithful to the house of God, faithful to the word of God, faithful to the prayer. You say, well, what's my specific purpose? Your purpose is to be a shining light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ exactly where you are. It's not a mistake that you're in the location where you are. It's not a mistake. God didn't wake up one morning and say, my goodness, man, I can't believe I stuck them down there in 2022. It's not a mistake that we went through lockdown. That didn't catch God off, off guard. Nothing catches him off guard. So understand this. Everyone has a purpose tonight, else you would not be here. God doesn't have to take your life. All he has to do is stop giving you life. We have a purpose, guys. A legacy of intentional influence, leading with purpose. We've seen the purpose of Paul's leadership was to change people's lives by leading them to walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to please God, bearing fruit in every good work, he says. So where do you think Paul got his pattern? And there was one who came as a natural born leader. Now when I say one who, those, that one is capitalized and that who is capitalized. There was one who loved more than anyone else. There was one who has given more life than any can give. Paul's example was Jesus Christ who came as the world's greatest leader because he loves his creation enough to give his life so that you and I may have eternal life. Galatians 2.20 tells us, I am crucified with Christ. This is Paul writing back. Nevertheless, I live, not yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Guys, this is the choice that we all have today. And I'm going to say this is the choice that we have today because tomorrow never comes. Paul had the greatest example in all the world of his leadership. We're not promised the next second. We are gifted 86,500 seconds each day. You cannot save them. You cannot reuse them. You cannot duplicate them. You can only use them. And we're not promised the very next one. But the beauty of the, of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ is second to none. It does not matter today who we are, 
what we have done, or for that matter, what we will do, what does matter tonight, is that each one of us have the forgiveness of all our sins, a gifted eternal life by freely choosing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, by simply inviting him into our hearts, by asking forgiveness of sin and confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, believing on his death, burial, and resurrection. You say, well, preacher, what do I do after that? That's the ripple effect. I don't know what year you made that decision. I don't know what day. I don't know what time. I don't know what happened. But I know this to be an absolute positive fact tonight, that the day that you made your decision to accept Christ as your Savior freely was a pebble dropped into water and a ripple effect into the world. Paul is a continuation of Christ's splash on the cross of Calvary. So tonight, how can, how can I and how will I impact the world today? How am I going to do it right here, right now? By continuing what Paul did. By continuing what the Lord has given us an example for. By looking at that church at Thessalonica that says you guys have become examples of the word across everywhere. So beloved, it starts with a splash. It develops by a legend. And that's what leaves a legacy. But the choice is yours tonight to do with this very second. Not tomorrow. But right here, right now. We bow your heads this evening. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and time to be together tonight. We pray that you take your word. Lord, that you would instill it inside of everyone's heart tonight. I pray, dear God, that you would impress upon every soul to take on board this evening, to be intentional, intentional in their purpose in this life, to have an impact in others. That they would follow the leadership of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of the Apostle Paul. That, Father, they would be invested, be involved to influence those around them. Lord, please let us never forsake, let us never underestimate the ripple effect in our life as it pertains to the lives of others. And let us strive each day, without fail, to have an impact on those around us positively. I pray to God for every soul here tonight, everyone that may hear this sermon somewhere, that you may have this influence in their life, in their days, that they may go forward and have the influence in the lives of others. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen. 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 I hope and pray that preaching and teaching was a blessing to your